Ladies and gentlemen, this is the fourth time I've recorded this episode of the Open Guard Cast, and I can barely take it anymore. I'm trying to do this new thing where I'm using OBS Studio to help me make YouTube video content for the Open Guard Cast, and it's not working. But you know what? This is the last time I'm going to do it, so welcome. We're going to go over Charles Oliveira versus Benio Dariush. We're going to go over Amanda Nunes, mauling Irene Aldana. And we're going to go over Cade Rotolo defeating Tommy Langacker. Before I preview my next episode of the Open Guard Cast, which will be tomorrow with Lionel Turner of Leo Optics. Please work this time if you're here and you're still listening. Thank you for sticking it out with me. Appreciate it. Uh, this episode of the Open this Oh my gosh. Do you hear that? That's how frustrated I am with this episode. This episode of the Open Guard Cast is brought to you by SoTellUs.com. Go to SoTellUs.com slash Open Guard Cast to learn more about how the only video capture review system on the planet can help you grow your small business, your presence online, Google My Business Rating, everything for your small business. Cool? All right. So I want to say that Charles Oliveira versus Benil Dariush was an incredible match. Uh, I am just floored with the presence that Charles Oliveira has, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. But holy moly, what really was promoted at more than the main event, I'll say, is this match. Charles Oliveira coming back in style with a great TKO over Benil Darius. Benil had been on a crazy win streak, and a lot of people were saying, man, this guy has the tools to take down Islam. I think he has what it takes. His jiu-jitsu's there. His power's there. He's experienced. He's on a tear. He's only getting better with every fight. They thought he was the man to do it. And here's the thing. You can't call, you can't uh, count out Charlie Olives, as they're calling him on Twitter, I think it's a funny name, but Charles Oliveira is the kind of person, he's the kind of champion that is just so impressive. He has tight boxing, great kicks, his striking is fluid, it's very precise, and his jiu-jitsu is obviously statistically the best in lightweight history, the best in UFC history. Now, Benio Dariush, no slouch on the ground, and I won't even say no slouch, but also incredible on the ground. Uh, he's done well in the IBJJF circuit at the Colored Belts, which is a fun in little tidbit of information that uh, Trumpet Dan Lukehart put on Facebook, and I thought that was very interesting, so I figured I'd share. But also has had a close match with Crone Gracie. Benil is not to be traveled with on the ground, so a lot of people thought that might be an equalizer in the match with Charles Oliveira, but it turned out to not even matter because... Really, Charles had a great job defending off of his back, mitigating damage, though Benil was able to, when he was on top, put some pressure down, throw some elbows, throw some strikes. Charles did what Charles does and defend on the ground, remain dangerous, throwing up his legs, looking for different attacks here and there. It kept Benil very honest, especially in the leg lock situations, which Jiu-Jitsu fans were treated to a bit of a nice exchange between the two, and I really love to watch that as well. Um, but really on the feet, and you know, Daniel Cormier was given the keys to victory segment on the broadcast, and he said the key to victory for Charles Oliveira would be to stay on the feet. And I thought that that was a little interesting to put, but it did. it is worth mentioning that the fight was ended on the feet. And I thought that the advantage that Charles did have was on the feet. Benil has power. He has hands of stone, but he doesn't have the precision that Charles Oliveira does. He even stands a little more wobbly, awkwardly, whereas Charles stands with his guard very tight, throws tight hooks, tight kicks. He's always aiming properly, always going forward, pushing the pace. It's a lot to deal with. Uh, I want to say also an interesting little, this is an MMA analyst gave me this bit of information. He didn't give it to me personally, but I heard it on a, on one of his promotions and I wish that I memorized the name, but he had said that Charles Oliveira has done this thing where he's kind of given himself a built in eight count versus competitors who are too afraid to go to the ground with him. And here's what I mean. Let's say he gets rocked by Justin Gaethje, or he gets clipped by Dustin Poirier. Goes and willfully sits on his back with his hands behind his head, his legs ready to kick, and he waits. And he waits until he's good, and they, you know, they come forward and throw, you know, throw the the kicks to the legs that fighters do just to kind of get the referee to stand him back on their feet. And once the referee stands him back on their feet, Charles Oliveira has effectively waited out the time that he had spent feeling rocked. And he's back in the match. Versus Islam, the problem was that Islam rocked him and immediately followed up because he was unafraid. He had the grappling to deal with that. And the reason why that's important is because not only did people think, oh, that might be a problem with Benil as well because he's not going to be afraid to go to the ground with Charles Oliveira. It's what is Charles going to do differently in a rematch? Because now effectively, I mean, 
we have the match with Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier happening. And man, Dustin, he's done so much to earn a title shot. Really, he he has, right? If he beats Justin Gaethje, then it's like, okay, well, now you say, does Charles Oliveira get the shot before Islam? Islam, does he do the rematch with Volk? Because Volk, that fight was so close and honestly controversial in a lot of people's opinions. It, the lightweight division is, a, is in a weird spot right now. And I think that Volkanovski is definitely somebody who deserves a rematch. Like, that's not out of the question. Even though he he could wait for the rematch. But instead, he's fighting Yair Rodriguez, which we'll go over on a later episode of the Open Guard cast once that match happens. But just really incredible stuff happening in the lightweight division. I'm very excited about it. And this match was so just nice. It was nice to watch. It was hard because you like uh, you like both competitors. This wasn't an instance where you know an athlete was saying nasty things and you're like, oh man, if he gets knocked out, I'm not going to be upset. Both of these guys are fantastic people who fight for you know, noble causes, do whatever they can to help the people around them, uh, preach a good message. It's just, it's it's hard to watch one of them lose. And Charles to go out there in the post fight and say, first of all, speak English for the first time in a post match interview, but also to set up a promo like that. They're really coming. He's really coming into his own in a sh- in a showman aspect as well, which a lot of people, including the media pundits, would like criticize him for not very marketable doesn't speak English, it's hard, right? The, the UFC didn't seem like they wanted to market him very much either because he didn't speak English. But that's all I wanted to go over with that match. It's incredible that Charles Oliveira did what he did. I'm going to try to limit the amount of times I say incredible in this episode, by the way. So take a sip of water every time I say it, and uh, hopefully you won't be hydrated by the end. Amanda Nunez mauling Irene Aldana. I don't even have much to say about the match other than it seemed less like Amanda was on point as Irene was timid. Now, Amanda's the kind of champion that she didn't really need to be super on point to have a great performance because she was a couple steps ahead of the rest of her competition. But what it looked like here was sort of the Gordon Ryan effect, let's call it. When people grapple Gordon Ryan, they might not do as well. When people play one-on-one versus Kobe or Michael Jordan, they might not do as well. Why? Because of who they are, not just what they do. If it was only about what the athlete did, then you could isolate it to, I'm using my skill to fight their skill. But that's not how athletics always works to people who get affected by that kind of thing. This match could have been, okay, it's Irene Aldana's boxing and footwork versus Amanda Nunez's boxing and footwork. But instead, it was Irene Aldana versus the greatest female athlete in mixed martial arts of all time, Amanda Nunez. And I think that that is what we saw. We saw... Irene, affected by the moment, affected by Amanda, affected by the spectacle. She's the double champ. This might, like, what is, what does all this mean? This is huge. I have a chance to shock the world. That's only ever happened once. There's so many questions that might come up, and I'm not saying that's exactly what happened, but it looked like that was happening. It looks like, man, I, you, you might have the skills, but if you don't have the mindset to use the skills, the skills might not ever come out. And so... Amanda Nunez just was able, I think Amanda Nunez could have done even more. I don't think Irene was there. And it's unfortunate because she's such a great fighter, Irene Aldana. She has tight boxing. She was definitely, she has the skills to be up to the challenge versus Amanda Nunez, but it just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't coming together for her because of the, just the moment. The moment was huge. And for Amanda Nunez to retire afterwards is is another point altogether. Uh, Interesting time to retire, I'll say. And a lot of people, some people were saying on Twitter, there's like two camps, right? There's like the Juliana Pena fans who are like, oh, she was running. And then there's a Juliana Pena, you know, haters that are like, oh, Juliana Pena is annoying. I don't know what the case is. I just am a, I'm an unbiased third party. But I did think at the very least, it was an interesting time to retire, especially with the rubber match with Juliana Pena on everybody's mind when they think about Amanda Nunes. Juliana Pena did shock the world. Amanda Nunes had her own bad night, and Pena took advantage of it, right? So I think that for her to retire after the match with Irene and to not do the third rematch with Juliana Pena, you open the door to criticism from Pena and possibly from her fans. You just open the door. Now, whether or not you actually ever need to fight again, that's a whole other uh, deal altogether. I don't think Amanda Nunez has anything left to prove because in the rematch with Pena, she beat her down. Plain and simple. It was so, 
it was so stark, the contrast between the bad day Nunez had versus Pena and the utter blowout that the second match was. Now, you could argue that a rubber match is still worthy of being worked out, but for Amanda Nunez, the greatest, like I said, the greatest female MMA fighter ever, 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 and how dominant she's been, she literally closed out a weight class in the UFC. She could do whatever she wants. She could retire. She could come out of retirement, go back into it, and you know, make it a April Fool's Day joke. She could do whatever she wanted. She's that kind of champion. She really did blow out a division. It's uh, it's very impressive stuff. So I have no idea what the featherweight division or the bantamweight division is going to be like going forward. I have no clue, but I'm 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 excited to see it. Um, and that being said, like look at Valentina Shevchenko's division, which is now Alexa Grasso's division. She's the champion. It's another division. Stuff is heating up. Stuff is getting interesting. Um, this was a really great UFC card, I think. I think a lot of people were like, oh man, you know, like I said, Charles Oliveira was hyped up a little more than Amanda Nunes was. But even then, Amanda Nunes took her moment, retired, made it, made it a, you know, put the cherry on top of the show and on top of her career. So moving on past MMA to one championship in Singapore. Cade Ruotol defeats Tommy Langacker in a great match. So uh Cade. First of all, I want to say the pace that he is able to put on was almost matched in this one, right? Cade is known for putting on an incredible pace, unlimited gas tank. Him and his brother work so hard. Him and his brother are always putting on some of the Nogi matches that we're talking about for, you know, months to come after. And Ty recently had his uh, his third place showing at the IBJJF World Championship, taking out names like Tarek Hopstock, having a great match with Jansen Gomez. But Cade goes out here in the one championship in a boxing ring this time versus Tommy Langacker. And there was some trash talk going on between there, right? Tommy was saying that Cade was going to polish his belt. Cade was saying, hey, let's change it to MMA, which, oh my gosh, if they would have done that, that would have, I would have taken a last minute flight to Singapore. It was so well done in the buildup to it. And I love that one championship gives jujitsu the same opportunity of a platform as Muay Thai and MMA, which objectively draw more numbers, but one championship still gives the athletes the opportunity to shine. They are still rock stars. They still draw fans in and give these athletes opportunities. It's beautiful. And you know what? The athletes grapple like they appreciate it. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a rule set of one championship. I don't know if it's a spectacle. I don't know if the athletes are given a thing and they read it before the match and part of the waiver is, hey, go out there and grapple exciting. I don't know. All I know is, it's working. And one championship is making these matches so exciting. I mean, Tommy from the bottom was throwing these attacks on Cade. Cade wrenching a steam lock as hard as he could. It was nonstop. It makes me wonder how where how do they have this kind of cardio? I'm over here like I'm doing a podcast. We're 13 minutes in and I'm about to like have a heart attack. And these guys are 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 going out here fighting with everything they have for 12, 15 minutes straight. I don't know how long the one championship rule set is. Uh, always, I don't know if it varies or changes, but my gosh, they're out here fighting. And Cade Rotolo looked great. He looks like the he looks like such a great champ. And uh, and you know, and very humble. I'm excited that Cade and Ty are are having their own gym made. I gotta go out there uh, to where they are. I want to do a training session with them, I, even if I get beat up by kids that you know. When I was a purple belt, they were green belts. Like that's fine. I'll, I'm okay with that. Um, because now they're black belts and they they've done a lot, <laughs> but I I would I would most certainly get submitted by them. But I'm I'm excited nonetheless. So just like I said, guys, this is not a very long episode of the Open Guard Cast, but I'm gushing because one championship is doing something so special. I am so excited for it, and I want to be a part of it. I really do. I really really do, and I'm working hard to get there. But I need your guys' support. Share this and do whatever you got to do. Tag people. It's just one championship is the. It's. Whew, it's it's a good show. So that is uh, about what I wanted to go over for this episode. I did not have an, a guest this week again. I'm doing my best to get guests on this show. Uh, I've been talking with Kit Dale. Now I think he's on his way to Europe. I've been talking with some of the guests that I've been talking to you guys about having on the show. Uh, leading up to some of these, you know, I, I have uh, some connections that I'm trying to make as well. Leading up to bigger shows and hey, previewing them, interviewing them beforehand. But like I said. When I don't have a guest, I'm going to come on here and I'm going to make content and I'm going to post it and I'm going to put it out there and we're going to keep this open guard cast thing going. 
Uh, shout outs to Fight Stars Network. Super excited to be working with you guys, and I'll hopefully have some more news for you guys on that. I'm also working on a redesign for the Open Guard cast. If you guys are watching on YouTube, this stuff that I have around the YouTube border is stuff I'm experimenting with. Please let me know if you guys like that as well. Doing my best. Uh, if you guys are listening on Spotify, please like this, share this, uh, review us. It helps me out so much. And once again, the Open Guard cast is brought to you by Sotellus which is uh, So Tell Us is an S, basically it's an SEO video capturing review system for small businesses. If you guys want to know more, go to So Tell Us. It's like So Tell Us.com slash Open Guardcast. Go find out more. Uh, but last but not least, I will be interviewing uh, Lionel Turner. He'll be my first guest in a little bit on the Open Guardcast tomorrow at uh, 12 o'clock is when I will be talking with him. He is reviving Lao Optics. If you guys remember Lao, as in Lion in Portuguese, Optics was was and is the premier sunglasses brand in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and they're made all custom. I believe they're made out of bamboo. They A lot of athletes have worn them. I, almost, I wondered where they went for a while. I was working with Lionel uh, for a bit, and to have him back in the community is very cool. It's very exciting, and I'm very fortunate to be in this position to uh, interview him and discuss the return and discuss what's everything happening there. So Lionel, if you're listening to this episode of the, of the open guard cast, I love you, brother. I'm excited to talk to you and guys, I love you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the open guard cast. If there's any opportunities, uh, to commentate your show, if you're a super fight promoter, I will go out there and do it. And if you are listening and you want, uh, to ask me a question that you want featured answered on the show, maybe also doing a Q and a segment at the end of the episode, I would love to do that. Uh, but also I want to say if there's something you'd like me to cover and talk about, send me a message on Instagram at Jake Watson media, and I will answer it. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what episode of the open guard cast this is, but it's been a pleasure recording it. So I'll talk to you guys very soon. God bless you. And thank you for listening.